Dr. Robert Vinoy, Old Testament History, Lecture Number 5. I believe I just mentioned two things that are foundational. First, God's existence is assumed. Second, monotheism is presumed, and in that sense it was taught. And then we had some discussion on the plural form of the noun for God, Elohim. The im ending is the plural ending in Hebrew, but that certainly is not an indication of polytheism, and probably not even a plurality in the deity, but rather a plural of majesty. Let's go on to C. God is the omnipotent creator of the universe. That is certainly clearly brought out in Genesis chapter 1. You have through that chapter the repeated expression, quote, and God said, and God said, and God said, end quote. He speaks in connection with a number of creative acts. So God is the omnipotent creator of the universe. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 says, quote, the universe was formed at God's command, end quote. Certainly, that is reflected in the teaching of Genesis 1 as well. All right, D. Quote, God is separate from his creation, end quote. There's no hint of pantheism in the Old Testament, where the deity is identified with the created order. The God of Genesis 1 through 3 and of the Old Testament is not a nature God. He's separate. He's distinct from his creation, and that sets the biblical material apart from a lot of the contemporary mythological material of the ancient Near East. So God is separate from his creation. G. Ernest Wright, in his The God Who Acts, says on page 21, I believe this is in your bibliography, it's on page 6, about the fourth entry. G. Ernest Wright, The God Who Acts, on page 21, he says, quote, here, then, is an utterly different God from all the gods of nature, cultural, and philosophic religion. He's no imminent power in nature, nor in the natural process of being and becoming. The nature of his being is revealed in his historical acts. He thus transcends nature as he transcends history, and consequently he destroys the whole basis of pagan religion. No force or power in the world is more characteristic to him than any other, and it is interestingly understood today that the former indications in early Israel of a mountain god, a fertility god, a war god, from which the ethical monotheism of the prophets gradually evolved, are figments of scholarly presupposition and imagination. It is impossible on any empirical grounds to understand how the God of Israel could have evolved out of polytheism. He is unique, sui generis, utterly different, end quote. I think that's a pretty good statement of the uniqueness of the deity that is described in the Old Testament and particularly even here in Genesis chapter 1. I think those four things I've mentioned, his existence being assumed, monotheism presupposed, he is the omnipotent creator of the universe, and he's separate from that creation. Those elements combine to give a unique, very high God concept that is very important for the rest of the Old Testament. Let's go on to two, quote, general teachings about the universe, end quote. I will begin with three comments that I think when taken together, are significant concerning the universe. A. The universe is not self-existent or divine. End quote. In other words, the universe is not an extension of the essence of God. So there is a distinction between God and the universe. It's not self-existent, and it's not divine. B. Quote, it is not inherently evil or antagonistic to God and man. End quote. And, of course, you find that in the repeated phrase also in Genesis, after the specific creative acts you, where you read, quote, God saw that it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, 
End quote. So the essential character of the created order is good. There are many philosophies and religions that hold that matter is basically evil, and they hold in that antithesis between matter and spirit that matter is evil. That's not a concept of the Bible. Of course, the creation becomes affected by the fall, but it is not inherently evil. The created order is pleasing and good. C. Quote, the universe came into being at the will of the divine creator. End quote. For it is not self-existent or divine, but it comes into being at the will of the divine creator. God calls it forth. He speaks these creative words, and it comes into being. And D. Quote, its formation follows orderly stages. End quote. We find that described throughout chapter 1 in the six days of creative activity. Its formation followed orderly stages. So I think that's sort of a summarization of general teaching about the universe. We are going to look at more specifics of Genesis 1, but that's certainly some of the general teaching. Thirdly, Genesis 1 through 2's general teaching about man. First, the same as with the universe, man is not self-existent or divine. Man is a creature that is created by God at a particular time in history, and he's separate from God. B. Man owes his existence to a creative act of God. Of course, we will discuss this later in relation to evolutionary theory to Genesis 1 and 2. I don't think you can accommodate Genesis 1 and 2 to an evolutionary view of the origin in any way. C. Man comes as the culmination of the creative acts of God. Genesis 1 runs to a climax, and it is on the sixth day, at the end of other creative activities, that God creates man and woman. So man comes as the culmination of the creative acts of God. D. Man is separate from all the rest of God's creation because he was made in the image and likeness of God. Yet, at a certain point, man shares characteristics with the rest of the creation by being a creature who is part of God's creation. But he's also distinct in that he possesses something that no other creature does, and that is the image of God. We find out in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, quote, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, end quote. And chapter 1, verse 27 points out, quote, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, end quote. I think you will get a long discussion of what the image of God in man is. What does that constitute? But I don't want to do that at this point. I think we could say that man is a spiritual, rational, and moral being, and that distinguishes man from the animals. He is made in the image of God. E. Man has divine authority or dominion over the animal creation and is given the task of subduing the earth. That's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Quote, God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. End quote. So I think those teachings together sort of summarize what we find in Genesis 1 concerning mankind. He's not self-existent or divine. He's one who owes his existence to a creative act of God. He comes as the culmination of the creative acts of God. He's separate from the rest of God's creation because of the image. And he has authority for dominion over the animals and to subdue the earth. Okay, let's go on to four. Quote, interpretations of Genesis 1 1. End quote. 
I've already mentioned Genesis 1-1 is a majestic statement, with no parallel in extra-biblical literature of the time. Quote, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. End quote. Now I've read from the King James. The NIV is the same except, quote, heavens, end quote, is plural. Quote, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, end quote. If you look at the ancient versions, the ancient translation of Hebrew to the New Testament, you get you get a similar rendering. What I mean by that is you find a rendering that makes Genesis 1-1 as an independent clause, a sentence with a period. Today, you look at a lot of commentaries and some translations, you will find that instead of an independent clause, it's a subordinate clause. If you take the RSV, for example, it translates it, quote, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, end quote, as does the King James. But it has a footnote. The footnote reads, quote, When God began to create the heaven and the earth, the earth was without form, etc. End quote. It makes it a subordinate clause to what follows. The New English Bible doesn't have any footnote. It just translates the phrase, quote, In the beginning of creation, when God made heaven and earth, the earth was without form and void, end quote. This again subordinates verse 1 to verse 2. So there's a lot of discussion, particularly in the commentaries. Is Genesis 1-1 to be taken as an independent clause, as a statement, or is it to be taken as a subordinate clause to what follows? Which is the best translation? I would say, grammatically, you could make a case for either. In other words, there's certain grammatical ambiguities, so you could argue it back and forth. So let's discuss this a bit further, under 4. I'll give you a couple subpoints that are not on your outline sheet. A is... Quote, Genesis 1-1 taken as an independent clause, end quote. I think this is the best way to understand it. That still doesn't answer certain questions. That is, how do you interpret the significance of the statement as an independent clause? What's its function? I think there are at least three possible interpretations as an independent clause. The first one would be, it's a summary of the entire chapter. Quote, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, end quote, is a summary of the entire chapter. In other words, it'd be much like a newspaper heading or a lead sentence in an essay. It sort of summarizes everything to follow. Now, there's a lot to be said for that interpretation. In fact, I just went into the NIV Study Bible, and a note on Genesis 1-1 says, quote, a summary statement introducing the six days of the creative activity, end quote. That's the interpretation that the NIV takes. The problem with that view is, and all these views have certain problems, that's why there are different views. That verse 2 does not seem like a suitable beginning of the story of creation. If verse 1 is just a headline, verse 2 doesn't seem like a suitable beginning of the story of creation, but rather it tells the state of unordered created matter. Quote, the earth was without form or void, darkness was upon the face of the deep. End quote. It would seem a bit strange to begin the creation account with, quote, the earth was formless and empty, end quote. but I'm not saying you cannot take 1 1 as an independent clause. It seems to me, though, that if you do take it as an independent clause, it would be best to understand it as creation ex nihilo. I'll use this term because it will come up later. It's a Latin phrase that is often used, quote, from nothing, end quote, quote, creation out of nothing, end quote. Creation ex nihilo is creation from nothing. This view understands, quote, in the beginning God created heaven and earth, end quote, as a reference to the ex nihilo creation of the ordered cosmos, 
not to reference to unstructured matter that is mentioned in verse 2. And if that's the case, then the creation account really begins in verse 3. Quote, and God said, let there be light. End quote. And so forth. Verse 2 would give the situation of the world before God began to speak. And then to remove any idea of pre-existent matter, you would say verse 1 is prefaced. It speaks of the whole thing in the sense of creation ex nihilo. Now that's sort of moving back from verse 3 to verse 1. But I think we could make a pretty good case for that. If this is the case, then you would understand verse 1 to be a summary of the entire chapter in the sense of creation ex nihilo and creation from nothing. And the, quote, heavens and the earth, end quote, would refer to the structured, ordered cosmos. The second way this has been taken is to understand Genesis 1-1 to refer to the original creation. Quote, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. End quote. An original creation that was one of beauty and order, but one which was distinct and far removed in time from verse 2. Now, what that assumes is, quote, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. End quote. Here was a beautiful, perfect creation, but then something intervened. There was a cataclysmic change. In verse 2, you read the earth, as the King James says, quote, was, end quote. You translate that, the earth, quote, became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, end quote. So that view assumes the cataclysmic change between verse 1 and verse 2. And usually that's connected with the fall of Satan that caused such a change to happen. There was an angel that rebelled and fell from his original position, affected the universe, and brought about disorder. The conditions of verse 2 in this view would not be how God originally created things, but they are the result of this cataclysmic change. Now the advocates of this view appeal to the verb in verse 2, which is translated, quote, was, end quote, in the King James. It's also translated, quote, was, end quote, in the NIV, although there is a note which says, quote, possibly became, end quote. It's a very familiar thing if you're taking Hebrew that the verb hayah can be translated either, quote, to be, end quote, or, quote, to become, end quote. Now that verbal form, hayah, to be or to become is used in a number of senses. Sometimes it means, quote, to come to pass, end quote. Sometimes it means, quote, to come into being, end quote. Sometimes it just means, quote, to be in existence, end quote. So I think that you can see from the word itself, it's sometimes used in a dynamic sense, quote, to become, end quote. Sometimes in a static sense, of just, quote, to be, end quote. It depends on the context which of those is to be preferred. I don't think you can base an argument on the word itself to prove one view or the other. Some will try to do that. Some will try to say, haya is always this dynamic sort of idea. Thus must be translated, quote, became, end quote. They try to use that to support the idea of a cataclysmic change between verse 1 and verse 2. I don't think usage will bear that out. I don't think you can base your argument on the meaning of the verb because it goes both ways. And I would say, in relation to this view, that it is grammatically possible, though haya can be used in the sense of, quote, became, but I don't think there's a great deal of evidence for this view. And the result of it is that the rest of the chapter really is not a creation account then. In a true sense of the word, it becomes a rehabilitation of the earth as a dwelling place for man and the animals, after you see the deterioration of an original perfect and beautiful creation. On your outline sheet, under Roman numeral 3, A, 4, on your bibliography sheet, 
right in the middle of the page, you see an entry by Weston W. Fields, Unformed and Unfilled. That is a book-length discussion of Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Weston Fields argues very strongly against this cataclysmic theory of a gap between 1-1 and 1-2. So if you're interested in reading a fuller discussion of what God spoke, you can look at Fields' book on the gap theory. Now, let me make just a comment here on the gap theory. You get into the question that we touched on in the previous outline when we were discussing these genealogies. Where do you put geologic time? There are really only three places you can put it. I'll work backwards. You can put it in the flood. We talked about that. Flood geology. All the strata put in the earth in geologic time and then you'd be putting it in Genesis chapters 6 through 9. You can put it in the days of Genesis 1, if you say, quote, day, end quote, to be a period of time rather than a 24-hour solar day. That's another alternative. We'll discuss that later when we get to it. Or you can put it between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. There are the three places in which you can do it. There are a lot of people that, in order to solve the problem of geologic time, some prefer this view because they can put that material between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. There have been various other passages in the Old Testament that have been cited as supporting this connection with the fall of Satan. I think the problem is, we could spend a lot of time discussing each of these passages, the problem is, each of these passages that are alluded to, there's some in Isaiah, there's some in Ezekiel, and there's some in Jeremiah, each of these have interpretive problems of their own. With most of them, there's a very real question if they are even talking about Satan, or whether they are talking about the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, or the king of Babylon in Isaiah chapter 14. Number two, there's no real link established with Genesis 1-2, even if those passages are talking about Satan. So you make a number of inferences in order to connect those passages into this, in order to establish this position. So I don't think it has the firmest evidence. Let's go on to number three. The third possibility is that the statement refers to the creation of matter. Quote, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. End quote. The heavens and the earth there are building blocks of the universe, you might say, matter in its raw stages. G.C.H. Alders takes this view. Alders was a Dutch Old Testament scholar who wrote a number of commentaries and other articles. He wrote a two volume commentary on Genesis recently translated into English and published by Zondervan in the Bible Student Commentary Series. I don't know if you've seen that. It's been out for the past four or five years. The Old Testament commentary was published in Dutch. Alders didn't write all the commentaries, but he did do Genesis, and in volume one of that commentary on Genesis by Alders, page 52, says on verse 1, quote, it's not just a heading, end quote. He rejects the first view. Quote, it is likewise true beyond doubt that the heavens and the earth do not here refer to the present organized universe as it appeared after the Genesis work described when Genesis 1 was completed. How the universe became what it is today is described in detail in verses 3 through 31. The heavens and the earth in verse 1 are thus a designation of the essence of the world before the detailed forming and ordering which is described in the rest of the chapter. We can conclude, then, that the heavens and the earth in verse 1 refers to the substance of the universe. We can also say Genesis 1-1 describes the substance from which the entire universe was formed." End quote. You see, with that view, it flows quite naturally into verse 2. If you understand, quote, 
heaven and the earth, end quote, to be a sort of figurative designation for the substance, the building block of the elements of the universe. You see that closing in verse 2, when the earth is without form and void, unstructured and unordered. And then it begins to be structured as stuff starts to occur. So that is also a possibility. The problem with it is that you have to take, quote, heaven and earth, end quote, then in a somewhat figurative sense, and you wonder, quote, should that be done, end quote. But it does give continuity with verse 2. So I think it merits serious consideration. To me, either the first view, the heading view, or this third view is the most likely. What does that, quote, earth, end quote, in verse 2 represent? It seems to represent some kind of unstructured situation of existence before God began to order things as described in the rest of chapter 1. All right, B under 4 was, quote, taking Genesis 1-1 as an independent clause, end quote. I gave you three interpretations of the phrase as an independent clause. B is to take Genesis 1-1 as a subordinate clause. Now, as a subordinate clause, there are basically two views. One would make the verse subordinate to verse 2, and the other would make it subordinate to verse 3, with verse 2 sort of a parenthesis. The first view is that verse 1 is subordinate to verse 2. Now, the whole reason for this discussion centers around the first word in the Hebrew text, which is Bereshit, quote, in the beginning, end quote. Those of you who haven't had Hebrew, or even if you have, I'm not going to dwell on the Hebrew, but just to say that the question is whether that first word is to be understood as being in the absolute or the construct state. The grammarians argue about that, and I don't want to get into the technical part of that, but I think there are two considerations that strongly favor understanding it as an absolute. If you understand it as an absolute, then you will take it as an independent clause, quote, in the beginning God created, end quote. If you take it as a construct, then you're going to take it as a subordinate clause. Now, those of you who have had Hebrew know something about absolute and construct states. If you haven't had Hebrew, take it down. When you do have it, it will make some sense to you. If you don't ever take it, you can just pay attention to what follows from this discussion. There are two things that strongly favor the absolute. First is that the Masoretic text accents accent the word with a disjunctive accent. That is a strong indication that the Masoretes understood it as absolute. Of course, the Masoretes were later than 1000 AD, and they accented with a disjunctive accent that indicates that they understood it as an absolute. Secondly, with no exception, the ancient versions take it as an absolute when they translated it. In other words, the Septuagint Greek translations of the Old Testament, Syriac, and all the ancient versions understand it without exception as an absolute. That doesn't mean that it couldn't be a construct. There's some ambiguity there. It could be. But it seems that the weight of the evidence favors the absolute. Now, those that take it as a construct and translate it something like, quote, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, end quote, most of them would subordinate it to verse 2. Quote, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, darkness was upon the face of the deep, end quote. Some, however, would say that verse 2 is a parenthesis, and verse 1 should be read, quote, And when God began to create the heavens and the earth, parenthesis, the earth was now darkness and void, end of parenthesis, then God said, you see, when God began to create, then God said, verse 3 is a continuation to the statement from verse 1, with verse 2 as a parenthesis. That makes it rather awkward and complicated. We'll pick that up in the next hour.
This ends Dr. Robert Vinoy's Old Testament History, Lecture Number 5. Thank you.